Chapter Eleven of the Little Baron's Marvelous Underground Journey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey. Chapter Eleven. Pleasant days passed among the Mikkamenkies, and wonderful things seen by us. The spectral garden and a description of it our meeting with damozel glowstone and what came of it from now on lord bulger and i made ourselves perfectly at home among the mikkamenkies one of the royal barges was placed at our disposal and when we were tired of walking about and gazing at the wonders of this beautiful city of the underworld we stepped aboard our barge and were rowed hither and thither on the glassy river and if i had not seen it myself i never would have believed that any kind of shellfish could ever be taught to be so obliging as to swim to the surface and offer one of their huge claws for our dinner politely dropping it in our hand the moment we laid hold of it on one of the river banks i noticed a long row of wooden compartments looking very much like a grocer's bins but you may think how amused bulger and i were upon coming closer to this long row of little houses to find that they were turtle nests and that quite a number of the turtles were sitting comfortably in their nests busy laying their eggs which let me assure you were the most dainty tidbits i ever tasted i think i informed you that the river flowing through Gogoland was fairly swarming with delicious fish the carp and sole being particularly delicate in flavour and knowing as i did what a tender-hearted folk the mikkamenkies are i had been not a little puzzled in my mind as to how they had ever been able to summon up courage enough to drive a spear into one of these fish which were as tame and playful as a lot of kittens or puppies and followed our barge hither and thither snapping up the food we tossed to them and leaping into the air where they glistened like burnished silver as the white light sparkled on their scales but the mystery was solved one day when i saw one of the fishermen decoying a score or more of fish into a sort of pen shut off from the river by a wire netting scarcely had he closed the gates when to my amazement i saw the fish one after the other come to the surface and float about on their sides stone dead this little baron explained the man in charge is the death chamber hidden at the bottom of this dark pool lie several electric eels of great size and power and when our people want a fresh supper of fish we simply open these gates and decoy a shoal of them inside by tossing their favourite food into the water the executioners are awaiting them and in a few instants the fish while enjoying their repast and suspecting no harm are painlessly put to death as thou hast seen one part of the city of the transparent folk which attracted bulger and me very much was the royal gardens it was a weird and uncanny place and upon my first visit i walked through its paths and beneath its arbours upon my toes and with bated breath as you might steal into some bit of fairyland looking anxiously from side to side as if at every step you expected some sprite or goblin to trip you up with a tough spider-web or brush your cheeks with their cold and satiny wings now dear friends you must first be told that with the loss of sunshine and the open air the flowers and shrubs and vines of this underground world gradually parted with their perfumes and colours their leaves and petals and stems and tendrils growing paler and paler in hue like lovelorn maids whose sweethearts had never come back from the war month by month the dark greens the blush pinks the golden yellows and the deep blues pined away longing for the lost sunshine and the wooing breeze they loved so dearly until at last transformation was complete and there they all stood or hung bleached to utter whiteness like those fantastic clumps of flowers and wreaths of vines which the feathery snow of april builds in the leafless shrubs and trees i cannot tell you dear friends what a strange feeling came over me as i stepped within this spectral garden where ghost-like vines clung in fantastic forms and figures to the dark trellises and where tall lilies whiter than the down of eider stood bolt upright like spirits doomed to eternal silence denied even the speech of perfume and where huge clusters of snowy chrysanthemums fluffy feathery forms seemed pressing their soft bodies together like groups of banished celestials in a sort of silent despair as they felt the warmth and glow of sunlight slowly and gradually quitting their souls where lower down great roses with snowy petals whiter than the seashells hung motionless bursting open with eager effort as if listening for some signal 
that would dissolve the spell put upon them and give them back the sunshine and with it their colour and their perfume where lower still beds of violets bleached white as fleecy clouds seem wrapped in silent sorrow at loss of the heavenly perfume which had been theirs on earth where above the lilies heads shot long slender spectral stalks of sunflowers almost invisible loaded at their ends with clusters of snowy flowers thus suspended like white faces looking down through the silent air and waiting waiting for the sunshine that never came and higher still all over and above these spectral flowers entwining and enwrapping and falling festoon and garlandwise crept and ran like unto long lines of escaping phantoms ghostly vines with ghostly blossoms bent and twisted and wrapped and coiled into a thousand strange and fantastic forms and figures which the white light with its inky shadows made alive and half human so that movement and voice alone were needful to make this garden seem peopled with sorrowing sprites banished to these subterranean chambers for strange misdeeds done on earth and condemned to wait ten thousand years ere sunlight and their colour and their perfume should be given back to them again while strolling through the royal gardens one day bulger suddenly gave a low cry and bounded on ahead as if his eyes had fallen upon the familiar form of some dear friend when i came up with him he was crouching beside the damozel glowstone who seated on one of the garden benches was caressing bulger's head and ears with one of her soft hands with its filmy like skin while the other held its black fan pressed tightly against her bosom she looked up at me with her crystal eyes and smiled faintly as i drew near thou seest little baron she murmured lord bulger and i have not forgotten each other since our presentation at court i had been going through and through my mind in search of some reason for bulger's sudden affection for damozel glowstone but had found none i was the more perplexed as she was but the maid of honour while the fair princess crystallina sat on the very steps of the throne but i said nothing save to reply that i was greatly pleased to see it and to add that where bulger's love went mine was sure to follow oh little baron if i could but believe that sighed the fair damozel thou mayest said i indeed thou mayest then if i may little baron she replied i will and prithee come and sit beside me here only till i bid thee look not through me dost promise i do fair damozel was my answer and thou lord bulger lie there at my feet she continued and keep thy wise eyes fixed upon me and thy keen ears wide open little baron if both thine and our worlds were filled with sorrowing hearts mine would be the heaviest of them all listen oh listen to the sad sad tale of the sorrowing maid with the speck in her heart and when thou knowest all give me of thy wisdom End of chapter eleven baron trump's marvellous underground journey chapter twelve this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state baron trump's marvellous underground journey by ingersoll lockwood chapter twelve the sad sad tale of the sorrowing princess with a speck in her heart and what all happened when she had ended it which the reader must read for himself little baron and dear lord bulger began the crystal-eyed damozel after she had eased her soul of its load of woe by three long and deep deep sighs know then that i am not the damozel glowstone but none other than the royal princess crystallina herself that she whose hair i comb should comb mine that she whom i have served for ten long years should have served me and to think o oh princess i burst out joyfully that my beloved bulger should have been the first to discover that she who was seated on the steps of the crystal throne was not entitled to the seat to think that his subtle intellect should have been the first to scent out the wrong that had been done thee his keen eye the first to go to the bottom of the truth's well but fair princess i am bursting with impatience to know how thou thyself did ever discover the wrong that has been done thee that thou shalt speedily know little baron answered crystallina and that thou mayest know all that i know i'll begin at the very beginning the day i was born there was great rejoicing in the land of the micamenkes and the people gathered in front of the royal palace 
and laughed and cried by turns so happy were they to think they were to be governed by another princess after queen galaxa's heart should run down for many years ago a bad king had made them very unhappy and they had hoped and prayed that no more such would come to reign over them and pretty soon one of them began to tell the others what he thought the little princess would be like she will be the fairest that ever sat upon the crystal throne her hands and feet will be like pearls tipped with coral her hair whiter than the river's foam and from her beautiful eyes will burst the radiance of her pure soul and her heart oh her heart will be like a little lump of frozen water so clear and so transparent will it be so like a bit of purest crystal bright and flawless as a diamond of the first water and therefore let her be called the princess crystallina or the maid with the crystal heart forthwith the cry went up i let her be called crystallina or the maid with the crystal heart and queen galaxa heard the cry of her people and sent them word that it should be as they wished that i should be the princess crystallina but ah me that i should have lived to tell it after a few days the nurse came to my royal mother wringing her hands and pouring down a flood of tears throwing herself on her knee she whispered to the queen royal mistress bid me die rather than tell thee what i know being ordered to speak the nurse informed queen galaxa that she had that day for the first time held me up to the light and had discovered that there was a speck in my heart the queen uttered a cry of horror and swoon when she came to herself she directed that i should be brought to her and held up to the light so that she might see for herself alas too true there was a speck in my heart sure enough i was not worthy of the sweet name which her loving people had bestowed upon me they would turn from me with horror they would never consent to have me for their queen when the truth should become known they would not be moved by a mother's prayers they would turn a deaf ear to every one who should be bold enough to advise them to accept a princess with a speck in her heart when they had thought they were getting one well deserving of the title they had bestowed upon her queen galaxa knew that something must be done at once that it would be time and labor lost to attempt to reason with the disappointed people so she set to work thinking up some way out of her trouble now it so happened little baron that the very day i had come into the world a babe had been born to one of queen galaxa's serving women and so hastily summoning the woman she ordered her to bring her babe into the royal bedchamber and leave it there promising that it should be brought up as my foster sister but no sooner had the serving woman gone her way rejoicing than the nurse was ordered to change the children in the cradle and in a few moments glowstone was wrapped in my richly embroidered blanket and i swathed up in her plain coverlets how things went for several years i know not but one day ha ah, how well i recollect it my little mind was puzzled by hearing crystallina cry out nay nay dear malma tis not fair i like it not each day when thou comest to us thou givest close on ten kisses and me but single one then would queen galaxa smile a sad smile and bestow some bauble upon crystallina to coax her back to contentment again and so we went on crystallina and i from one year to another until we were little maids well grown and she sat on the throne and wore royal purple stitched with gold and i plain white but still most of the kisses fell to my share and i marvelled not a little at it but dared not ask why it was however once when i was alone with queen galaxa seated on my cushion in the corner plying my needle and thinking of the sail we were to have on the river that day suddenly i was startled to see the queen throw herself on her knees in front of me and to feel her clasp me in her arms and cover my face and head with tears and kisses as she sobbed and moaned oh my babe my lost babe my blessing and my joy wilt never 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 come back to me art gone forever must i give thee up oh must i nay royal lady i stammered in my more than wonder at her words and actions thou art in a dream awake and see clearly i am not crystallina i am glowstone thy foster-child 
i'll hie me straight and bring my royal sister to thee but she would not let me loose and for all answer showered more kisses on me till i was well nigh smothered so tight she held me pressed against her bosom while around and o'er me her long thick tresses fell like a woven mantle and then she told me all all that i have told thee little baron and charged me never to impart it unto any soul in Goggleland, and i made a solemn promise unto her that i never would and thou hast kept thy word like a true princess as thou art said i cheerily for i am not of thy world fair crystallina now that i have told thee a sad tale of the sorrowing princess with the speck in her heart little baron murmured crystallina fixing her large and radiant eyes upon me there is but one thing more for me to do and it is to let thee look through me so that thou mayest know exactly what counsel to give and so saying the fair princess rose from her seat and having placed herself in front of me with a flood of white light falling full upon her back she lowered her black fan and bade me gaze upon the heavy heart which she had carried about with her all those years and tell her exactly how large the speck was and where it lay and what colour it was i was overjoyed to get an opportunity at last to look through one of the mickaminkies and my own heart bounded with satisfaction as i looked and looked upon that mysterious little thing nay rather a tiny being living breathing palpitating within her breast now slow and measured as she dwelt in thought upon her sad fate now beating faster and faster as the hope bubbled up in her mind that possibly i might be able to counsel her so wisely that an end would come to all her sorrow well wise little baron she murmured anxiously what seest thou is it very large in what part is it is it black as night or some colour less fatal take courage fair princess said i it is very small and lies just beneath the bow on the left side nor is it black but reddish rather and if a single drop of blood from the veins of thy far distant ancestors had outlived them these thousands of years and hardened there to tell whence thy people came the princess wept tears of joy upon hearing these comforting words if it had been black she whispered i would have lain me down in this bed of violets and never risen more till my people had come to bear me to my grave in the silent burial chamber unvisited by the river of light at this sad outbreak bulger whined piteously and licked the princess's hands as he looked up at her with his dark eyes radiant with sympathy she was greatly cheered by this message of comfort and it moved me too by its heartiness list fair princess said i gravely i own the task is not a little one but hope for the best i would that we had more time but as thou knowest queen galaxa's heart will soon run down therefore must we act with dispatch as well as wisdom but first of all must i speak with the queen and gain her consent to act for thee in this matter that i fear she will never grant moaned crystallina however thou art so much wiser than i do as best seems to thee the next thing to be done fair princess i added solemnly is to show thy heart boldly and fearlessly to thy people nay little baron she exclaimed rising to her feet that may not be that may not be for know that our law doth make it treason itself for one of our people to look through a person of royal blood oh no oh no little baron that may never be stay sweet princess i urged in gentlest tones not so fast thou dost not know what i mean by showing thy heart boldly to thy people never fear i will not break the law of the land and yet they shall look upon the speck within thy heart and see how small it is and hear what i have to say about it and thou shalt not even be visible to them oh little baron murmured crystallina if this may only be i feel they will forgive me thou art so wise and thy words carry such strong hope to my poor heavy heart that i almost nay fair princess i interrupted hope for the best no more i am not wise enough to read the future and from what i know of thy people they seem but little different from mine own perchance i may be able to sway them toward my views and make them cry long live princess crystallina but i can only promise thee to do my best betake thee now to the palace and scorn not for yet a day or so to take up the golden comb and play the damozel glowstone in all humility End of chapter twelve
Chapter Thirteen of Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey by Ingersoll Lockwood. Chapter Thirteen: How I Set to Work to Undo a Wrong that Had Been Done in the Kingdom of the Mikamenkis, and How Bulger Helped queen galaxis confession i am created prime minister as long as she lives what took place in the throne room my speech to the men of goggle land after which i showed them something worth seeing how i was pulled in two different directions and what came of it the first thing i did after the genuine princess crystallina had left me was to seek out dr nebulosus and learn from him the exact number of hours before the queen's heart would run down as he had just been making an examination he was able to tell me the very minute it was seventeen hours and thirteen minutes rather a short time you must confess dear friends in which to accomplish such an important piece of business as i had in mind i then made my way directly to the royal palace and demanded a private audience with the lady of the crystal throne with the advice of sir amber opaque and lord cornucore she firmly but graciously refused to receive me giving as an excuse that the excitement that would be sure to follow an interview with the man of coal so the mikamikis had named me would shorten her life at least thirteen minutes but i was not to be put off in so unceremonious a manner sitting down i seized a pen and wrote the following words upon a piece of glazed silk to galaxa queen of the mikamikis lady of the crystal throne i lord bulger a Mikamenkian noble, bearer of this, who was the first to discover that the real princess was not sitting on the steps of the crystal throne, demand an audience from my master, Baron Sebastian von Trump, commonly known as the Little Baron, and prompted by him I ask, What are thirteen minutes of thy life, O Queen Galaxa, to the long years of sorrow and disappointment in store for thy royal child? Taking this letter in his mouth, Bulger sprang away with long and rapid bounds, in a few minutes he was in the presence of the queen for the guards had fallen back affrighted as they saw him draw near with his dark eyes flashing indignation raising himself upon his hind feet he laid the letter in galaxa's hands the moment she had read it she fell into a swoon and all was a stir and commotion in and round about the palace i was hastily summoned and the audience chamber cleared of every attendant save dr nebulosus sir amber opaque lord cornucore lord bulger and me send for the demoiselle glowstone commanded the queen and when she had appeared to the amazement of all saving bulger and me galaxa bade her mount the steps of the crystal throne then having embraced her most tenderly the queen spoke these words o oh, faithful counsellors and wise friends from the upper world this is the real princess crystallina whom i have for all these years wickedly and wrongfully kept from her high state and royal privileges she was born with a speck in her heart and i feared that it would be useless to ask my people to accept her as my successor oh lady of the crystal throne exclaimed lord cornucore thou hast wisely done thy people would never have received her as princess crystallina for being by the laws of our land denied the privilege to look for themselves they never would have believed that this spot in the princess's heart was but a tiny speck like a single hair crystal in the arm of thy magnificent throne therefore o queen we counsel thee not to embitter thy last hours by differences with thy loving subjects my lord cornucore said i with a low bow i make bold to raise my voice against thine and crave permission from queen galaxa to parley with her people forbid it royal lady cried sir amber opaque savagely at which bulger gave a low growl and showed his teeth queen galaxa i added gravely a wrong confessed is half redressed this fair princess tis true hath a speck in her heart which ill accords with the name bestowed upon her by thy people bid me be master until thy heart run down and by the knighthood of all the trumps i promise thee that thou shalt have three hours of happiness ere thy royal heart has ceased to beat be it so little baron exclaimed galaxa joyfully i proclaim thee prime minister for the rest of my life 
at these words bulger broke out into a series of glad barks and raising upon his hind legs licked the queen's hand in token of his gratitude while the fair princess looked a love at me that was too deep to put into words i had now but a few hours to act the excitement so dr nebulosus assured me would shorten the queen's life a full hour it had always been my custom to carry about with me a small but excellent magnifying glass a double convex lens for the purpose of making examinations of minute objects and also for reading inscriptions too thine to be seen with the naked eye hastily summoning a skilful metal worker i instructed him to set the lens in a short tube and to enclose that tube within another so that i could lengthen it at my pleasure then having called together as many of the headmen of the nation as the throne room would hold i requested lord cornucore to inform them of the confession which queen galaxa had made namely that in reality damozel glowstone was princess crystallina and princess crystallina was damozel glowstone they were stricken speechless by this piece of information but when lord cornucore went on to tell the whole story and to explain to them why the queen had practised this deception upon them they broke out into the wildest lamentation rejecting it over and over again in piteous tones a speck in her heart a speck in her heart o oh, dire misfortune o oh, woeful day she can never be our princess if she hath a speck in her heart by this time my arrangements were complete i had placed the princess crystallina just outside the door of the throne room where she stood concealed behind the thick hangings and near her i had stationed dr nebulosus with a large circular mirror of burnished silver in his hand calling out in a loud voice for silence i thus addressed the weeping subjects of queen galaxa o micamenkes men of goggle-land transparent folk i count myself most happy to be among you at this hour and to be permitted by your gracious queen to raise my voice in defence of the unfortunate princess with a speck in her heart being of noble birth and an inhabitant of another world it was lawful for me to look through the sorrowing princess and i have done it yes micamenkes i have gazed upon her heart i have seen the speck within it give ear men of goggle land and you shall know how that speck came there for it is not as you doubtless think a coal-black spot within that fair enclosure clearer than the columns of galaxa's throne oh no micamenkes a thousand times no it is a tiny blemish of reddish hue a drop of princely blood from the upper world which i inhabit and this drop in all these countless centuries has coursed through the veins of a thousand kings and still kept its roseate glow still remembered the glorious sunshine which called it into being and now men of goggle land lest you think that for some dark purpose of mine own i speak other than the pure and sober truth behold i show you the fair crystallina's heart in its very life and being as it is beating and throbbing with hope and fear commingled look and judge for yourselves and with this i signalled to those on the outside of the palace to carry out my instructions in an instant the thick curtains were drawn and the throne room was wrapped in darkness and at the same moment dr nebulosus with his mirror caught the strong white rays of light and threw them upon crystallina's body while i through an opening in the hangings made haste to apply the tube to which the lens had been fitted and catching the reflected image of her heart threw it up in plain and startling view upon the opposite wall of the throne room upon seeing how small the speck was and how truthfully i had described it the micamenkes fell a weeping for purest joy and then as if with one voice they burst out long live the fair princess crystallina with the ruby speck in her heart and ten thousand blessings on the head of little baron trump and lord bulger for saving our land from cruel dissensions the people on the outside took up the cry and in a few moments the whole city was thronged with bands of queen galaxa's subjects singing and dancing and telling of their love for the fair princess with the ruby speck in her heart i had kept my word queen galaxa would have at least three hours of complete happiness ere her heart ran down but suddenly the river of light began to flicker and dim its flood of brilliant white rays night was coming noiselessly as if by magic the micamenkes faded from my sight stealing away in search of beds and as the gloom crept into the great throne room some one plucked me gently by the hand and a soft voice whispered i love i love thee oh who other than i can tell how i love thee 
and then a grip stronger than the gentle hand seized me by the skirt of my coat and dragged me away slowly but surely away through the darkness through the gloom out into the silent streets ever away until at last that soft voice choking with a sob seized its pleading and gasps farewell oh farewell i dare go no farther and so bulger in his wisdom led me on and ever on out of the city of the mikamenkies out upon the marble highway end of chapter thirteen Chapter Fourteen of Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey by Ingersoll Lockwood. Chapter Fourteen. Bulger and I turn our backs on the fair domain of Queen Crystallina, nature's wonderful speaking tube crystallina's attempt to turn us back how i kept bulger from yielding some incidents of our journey along the marble highway and how we came to the glorious gateway of solid silver me the sorrowing sebastian loaded with as heavy a heart as ever a mortal of my size had borne away with him did the wise bulger lead along the broad and silent highway farther and yet farther from the city of the mikamenkis until at last the music of the fountains pattering in their crystal basins died away in the distance and the darkness far behind me i felt that my wise little brother was right and so i followed on after with not a sigh or a syllable to stay him but he halted at last and as i felt about me i discovered that i was standing beside one of the richly carved seats that one so often meets with along the marble highway i was quite as foot-weary as i was heart-heavy in reaching out i touched the spring which i knew would transform the seat into a bed and clambering upon it with my wise bulger nestled beside me i soon fell into a deep and refreshing sleep when i awoke and sitting up looked back toward queen crystallina's capital i could see the river of light pouring down its flood of white rays far away in the distance but only a faint reflection came out to where we had passed the night and then i knew that my faithful companion had led me to the very uttermost limits of the Mikamenki domain before he had halted yes sure enough for as i raised my eyes there towering above the bed stood the slender crystal column which marked the end of goggle land and upon its face i read the extract from a royal decree forbidding a Mikamenki to overstep this limit under pain of incurring the queen's most serious displeasure before me was darkness and uncertainty behind me lay the fair kingdom of the transparent folk yet in sight lighted up like a long line of happy homes in which the fires were blazing bright and warm on the hearthstones did i turn back did i hesitate no i could see a pair of speaking eyes fixed upon me and i could hear a low whine of impatience coaxing me along stooping down i fastened a bit of silken cord taken from the bed to bulger's collar and bade him lead the way it was a long while before the light of queen crystallina's city faded away entirely and even when it ceased to be of any service in making known to me the grandeur and beauty of the vast underground passage i could still see it glitter like a silver star away away behind me but it disappeared at last and then i felt that i had parted forever with the dear little princess with the speck in her heart bulger didn't seem to have the slightest difficulty in keeping in the centre of the marble highway and never allowed the leading string to slack up for a moment however it was by no means a tramp through utter darkness for the lizards of which i have already spoken aroused by the sound of my footfalls snapped their tails and lighted up their tiny flash torches in eager attempts to discover whence the noise proceeded and what sort of a being it was that had invaded their silent domains we had covered possibly two leagues when suddenly a low and mysterious voice as soft and gentle as if it had dropped from the clear starry heavens of my own beautiful world reached my ear sebastian sebastian it murmured before i could stop to think i uttered a cry of wonder and the noise of my voice seemed to awake ten thousand of the tiny living flashlights inhabiting the cracks and crevices of the vast arched corridor flooding it for a moment or so with a soft and roseate radiance sebastian sebastian again murmured the mellow 
an echo-like voice coming from the very walls of rock beside me hastily drawing near to the spot whence the words seemed to come i laid my ear against the smooth face of the rock again the same soft sighing voice pronounced my name so clearly and so close beside me that i reached out to grasp crystalina's hand for hers was the voice the same low sweet voice that had told me of her sorrow in the spectral garden but there was no one there in reaching out however i had passed my left hand along the face of the wall and it had marked the presence of a round smooth opening in its rock face an opening about the size of a rainwater pipe in the upper world instantly it flashed upon my mind that through some whim of nature this opening extended for leagues back towards the city of the mikamenkies through the miles of solid rock and opened in the very throne-room of the princess crystallina yes i was right for after a moment or so again the same low sweet voice came through the speaking-tube of nature's own making and fell upon my ear i waited until it had ceased and setting my mouth in front of the opening i murmured in strong but gentle tones farewell dear princess crystallina bulger and the little baron both bid thee a long farewell and then raising bulger in my arms i bade him weep for his royal friend whom he would never see again he gave a long low piteous cry half whine half howl and then i listened for crystallina's voice it was not long in coming farewell dear bulger farewell dear sebastian crystallina will never forget you until her poor heart with the speck in it runs down and the crystal throne knows her no more poor bulger it now became my turn to tear him from this spot for crystallina's voice sounding thus unexpectedly in his ears had aroused all the deep affection which he had so ruthlessly smothered in order to bring his little master to his senses and free him from the charm of crystallina's grace and beauty but in vain all my strength all my entreaties were powerless to move him from the place evidently crystallina had heard me pleading with bulger and had imagined that i now would waver and stand irresolute heed dear bulger's prayer o oh, beloved she pleaded and turn back turn back to thy disconsolate crystallina whom thou madest so happy for a brief moment turn back o oh, turn back bulger now began to whine and cry most piteously i felt that something must be done at once or the most direful consequences might ensue that bulger crazed by the sweet tones of crystallina's voice might break away from me and dart away in mad race back to the city of the mikamenkies back to the fair young queen of the crystal throne it became necessary for me to resort to trick and artifice to save my dear little brother from his own loving heart drawing his head up against my body and covering his eyes with my left arm i quickly unloosened my neckerchief and thrusting it into this wonderful speaking-tube closed it effectively and thus i saved my faithful bulger from himself thus i closed his ears to the music of crystallina's voice but it was not until after a good hour's waiting that he could bring himself to believe that his beloved friend would speak no more after several hours more of journeying along the marble highway a speck of light caught my eye far on ahead and i redoubled my pace to reach it quickly i was soon rewarded for my trouble by entering a wonderful chamber circular in form with a domed roof in the centre of this fair temple of the underground world sprang a glorious fountain with a mighty rush of waters which brought with them such a phosphorescence that this vast round chamber was lighted up with a pale yellow light in which the countless crystals of the roof and sides sparkled magnificently here we passed the night or what i called the night refreshing ourselves with food which i had brought from the kingdom of the mikamenkies and drinking and bathing in the wonderful fountain which leaped into the air with a rush and a whir and filled it with a strange and fitful radiance upon awaking both bulger and i felt greatly refreshed both in body and mind and we made haste to seek out the lofty portal opening upon the marble highway and were soon trudging along it again hour after hour we kept on our feet for something told me that we could not be far away from the confines of some other domain of this world within a world and this inward prompting of mine proved to be correct for bulger suddenly gave a joyful bark and began to caper about as much as to say o oh, little master if thou only hadst my consent thou wouldst know that we are drawn near to human habitations of some kind sure enough 
in a few moments a faint light came creeping in beneath the mighty arches of the broad corridor and every instant it gathered in strength until now i could see clearly about me and then all of a sudden i caught sight of the source of this shy and unsteady light there in front of me towered two gigantic candelabra of carved and chased and polished silver both crowned with a hundred lights one on each side of the marble highway not the dull soft flames of oil or wax but the white tongues of fire produced by ignited gas escaping from the chemist's retort it was marvellous it was magnificent and i stood looking up at these great clusters of tongues of flames spellbound by the glorious illumination thus set in silent majesty at this gateway to some city of the underworld bulger's warning growl brought me to myself but i must end this chapter here dear friends and halt to collect my thoughts before i proceed to tell you what i saw after passing this glorious gateway illumined by these two gigantic candelabra of solid silver end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of baron trump's marvellous underground journey this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state baron trump's marvellous underground journey by ingersoll lockwood chapter fifteen the guards at the silver gateway what they were like our reception by them i make a wonderful discovery the world's first telephone bulger and i succeed in making friends with these strangers a brief description of the pseudopsies that is make-believe eyes or the forma folk that is ant people how a blind man may read your writing o oh, great don fum master of all masters what do i not owe thee for having made known unto me the existence of this wonderful world within a world would that i had been a worker in metal i would not have passed the glorious portal at which i had halted without having set in deep intaglio upon its silver columns the full name of the most glorious scholar whom the world has ever known bulger had warned me that this gateway was guarded and therefore i entered it cautiously taking care to peer into the dark corners lest i might be a target for some invisible enemy to hurl a weapon no sooner had i passed the gateway than three curious little beings of about my own height threw themselves swiftly and silently across the pathway they wore short jackets knee breeches and leggings reaching to their ankles but no hats or shoes and their clothes were profusely decorated with beautiful silver buttons their hands and feet and heads seemed much too large for their little bodies and pipe-stemmy legs and gave them an uncanny and browny look which was greatly increased by the staring and glassy expression of their large round eyes when i first caught sight of them they had hold of hands but now they stood each with his pair stretched out toward bulger and me waving them strangely in the air and agitating their long fingers as if they were endeavouring to set a spell upon us i imagined that i could feel a sensation of drowsiness creeping over me and made haste to call out nay good people do not strive to set a spell upon me i am the illustrious explorer from the upper world sebastian von trump and come to you with most peaceful intent but they paid no heed to my words merely advancing a few inches and with outstretched hands continued to beat and claw the air pausing only to signal to each other by touching each other's hands or different parts of each other's bodies i was deeply perplexed by their actions and took a step or two forward when instantly they fell back the same distance all men are brothers i exclaimed in a loud tone and carry the same shaped hearts in their breasts why do you fear me you are thrice my number in your own home i pray you stand fast and speak to me as i was pronouncing these words they kept jerking their heads back as if the sound of my voice were smiting them in the face it was very strange suddenly one of them drew from his pocket a ball of silken cord and deftly unrolling it tossed one end toward me it flew directly towards me for its end was weighted with a thin disc of polished silver as was the end retained in the hand of the thrower his next move was to open his jacket and apparently press his disc against his bare body right over his heart i made haste to do the same with mine holding it firmly in place this done he retreated a step or two until the silken cord had been drawn quite taut then he paused and stood for several instants without moving a muscle after which he passed the disc to one of his companions 
who having pressed it against his heart in turn passed it to the third of the group with the quickness of thought the truth now burst upon me the three brownie-like creatures in front of me were not only blind but they were deaf and dumb the one sense upon which they relied and which in them was of most marvellous keenness was the sense of feeling the strange motions of their hands and fingers so much like the beating and waving of an insect's feelers were simply to intercept and measure the vibrations of the air set in motion by the movements of my body their large round eyes too had but the sense of feeling but so wondrously acute was it that it was almost like the power of sight enabling them by the vibration of the air upon the balls to tell exactly how near a moving object is to them their purpose in throwing the silken cord and silver dish to me was by measuring the beating of my heart and comparing it with their own to determine whether i was human like them judge of my astonishment dear friends upon seeing one of their number point to the silver disc and by means of sign language give me to understand that they wanted to feel the heart of the living creature in my company stooping down i hastened to gratify their curiosity by applying it over my dear bulger's heart at once there was an expression of most comical amazement depicted on their faces as they passed the disc from one to the other and pressed it against different parts of their bodies now against their breasts now against their cheeks and even against their closed eyelids of course i knew that their amazement proceeded from the rapid beating of bulger's heart and i enjoyed their childlike surprise very much all expression of fear now vanished from their faces and i was delighted with the look of sweet temper and good humour that played about their features slowly and on tiptoe they drew near to bulger and me and for several minutes amused themselves mightily by running their long flexible fingers hither and thither over our bodies it did not take them long to discover that i was to all intents and purposes a creature of their own kind but not so with bulger their round faces became seamed and lined with wonder as they made themselves acquainted with his to them strange build and ever and anon as they felt him over would they pause and in lightning-like motions of their fingers on each other's hands and arms and faces exchange thoughts as to the wonderful being which had entered the portal of their city no doubt you are dying of impatience dear friends to be told something more definite concerning these strange people among whom i had fallen well know then that their existence had been darkly hinted at in the manuscript of the great master don fum i say darkly hinted at for you must bear in mind that don fum never visited this world within a world that his wonderful wisdom enabled him to reason it all out without seeing it just as the great naturalists of our day upon finding a single tooth belonging to some gigantic creature which lived thousands of years ago are able to draw complete pictures of him well these curious beings whose city bulger and i had entered are called by two different names in don fung's wonderful book in some places he speaks of them as the pseudopsies or make-believe eyes and in others as the formifolk or ant people either name was most appropriate their large round clear eyes being really make-believe ones for as i have told you they have absolutely no sense of sight while on the other hand the fact that they were deaf dumb and blind and lived in underground homes made them well entitled to the name of ant people in a few moments the three pseudopsies had succeeded in teaching me the main principles of their pressure language so that i was to their great delight enabled to answer a number of their questions but think not dear friends that these very wise and active little folk skilled in so many arts have no other language than one consisting of pressures of different degree made by their finger-tips upon each other's bodies they had a most beautiful language so rich that they were able to express the most difficult thoughts to give utterance to the most varied emotions in short a language quite the equal of ours in all respects save one it contained absolutely no word that could give them the faintest notion what colour was this is not to be wondered at for they themselves neither had nor could have even the faintest conception of what i meant by colour so that when i attempted to make them understand that our stars were bright points in the sky they asked me if they would prick my finger if i should press upon one of them but you doubtless are anxious to know how the form of folk can possibly make use of any other language than that of pressures well i will tell you every pseudopsy carried at his girdle a little blank book if i may so term it the covers being of thin silver plates variously carved and chased as the owner's taste may prompt the leaves of this book also consist of thin sheets of silver not much thicker than our tinfoil 
also fastened to his girdle by a silken cord hangs a silver pen or rather a stylus now when a pseudopsy wishes to say something to one of his people something too difficult to express by pressures of the finger-tips he simply turns over a leaf of the silver against the inside of either cover both of which are slightly padded and taking up his stylus proceeds to write out what he wishes to say and this done he deftly tears the leaf out and hands it to his companion who taking it and turning it over runs the wonderfully sensitive tips of his fingers over the raised writing and reads it with the greatest ease only of course he reads from right to left instead of from left to right as it was written so hereafter when i repeat my conversations with the former folk you will understand how they were conducted End of chapter 15chapter sixteen of baron trump's marvellous underground journey this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state baron trump's marvellous underground journey by ingersoll lockwood chapter sixteen ideas of the forma folk concerning our upper world the dancing spectre their efforts to lay hold of him my solemn promise that he should behave himself we set out for the city of the make-believe eyes my amazement at the magnificence of the approaches to it we reach the great bridge of silver and i get my first glance of the city of candelabra brief account of the wonders spread out before my eyes excitement occasioned by our arrival our silver bedchamber although thousands and thousands of years had gone by since the former folk had by constant exposure to the flicker and glare of the burning gas which their ancestors had discovered and made use of to illumine their underground world gradually lost their sense of sight and then in consequence of the deep and awful silence that forever reigned about them had also lost their sense of hearing and naturally thereafter their power of speech yet marvellous to relate they still kept within their minds dim and shadowy traditions of the upper world and the mighty lamp as they called the sun which burned for twelve hours and then went out leaving the world in darkness until the spirits of the air could trim it again and strange to say many of the unreal things of the upper world had been by the workings of their minds transformed into realities while the realities had become the merest cobwebs of the brain for instance the shadows cast by our bodies in the sunlight and forever following at our heels they had come to think were actual creatures our doubles so to speak and that on account of these dancing spectres as they called them which dogged our footsteps for our life long sitting like marjoys at our feasts it was utterly impossible for the people of the upper world to be entirely happy as they were and it occurred to them at once that i must have such a double following at my heels so several times they suddenly joined hands and forming a circle about me gradually closed up with intent to lay hold of the dancing spectre this they did too after i had assured them that what they had in mind was the mere shadow cast by a person walking in the light but as they had absolutely no idea of the nature of light i only had my trouble for my pains nor did they give over making every now and then the most frantic and laughable efforts to catch the little dancing gentleman who as they were bound to think was quietly trudging along at my heels but who so they informed me was far quicker in his motions than any escaping water or falling object finally they held one of their silent but very excited powwows during which the thousand lightning-like pressures and tappings which they made upon each other's bodies gave the spectator the idea that there were three deaf and dumb schoolboys engaged in a scrimmage over a bag of marbles and then they informed me that they had resolved to permit bulger and me to enter their city provided i would give them the word of a nobleman that i would restrain my nimble-footed double from doing them any harm i made them a most solemn promise that he should behave himself whereupon they greeted both bulger and me as brothers stroking our hair patting our heads and kissing me on the cheeks and what was more they told us their names which were long thumbs square nose and shaggy brows 
all this time i had been every now and then casting anxious glances on ahead of me for i was dying of impatience to enter the marvellous city of the ant people i say marvellous dear friends for though many had been the wonderful things i had seen in my lifetime in the far-away corners of the upper world yet here was a sight which as it gradually unfolded itself before my eyes shackled my very heart and caused me to gasp for breath it was with no little surprise at the very outset that i discovered that the walls and floor of the beautiful passage through which the pseudopsies were leading bulger and me were of pure silver the former being composed of polished panels ornamented with finely executed chasings and carvings and the latter as had in fact all the floors and streets and passages of the city having upon their polished surfaces slightly raised characters which i will explain later but as one passage opened into another and then four or more all centred in a vast circular chamber which we traversed with our three silent guides only to enter chambers and corridors of greater size and beauty all brilliantly lighted by rows of the same glorious candelabra upholding clusters of tongues of flame i could compare the scene to nothing save a series of magnificent ballrooms and banquet halls out of which the happy guests had been suddenly driven by the deep and awful rumble of an earthquake shock the lights having been left burning now the scene began to change long thumbs who was leading the way and in whose large palm my little hand lay completely lost suddenly turned to the right and led me up an arched way i saw that we were crossing a bridge over a stream as black and sluggish as the leaf itself but such a bridge never had my eye rested upon so light and airy a span springing from bank to bank not the plain and solid work of the stonemason but the fair and cunning result of the metal worker's skill like the labour of love delicate yet strong and almost too beautiful for use two rows of silver lamps of exquisite workmanship crowned its gracefully arching sides and when we stood upon its highest bend long thumbs halted and wrote upon his tablet now little baron we are about to enter the dwelling-place of our people thy head is large and there is no doubt much of wisdom stored away in thy brain make such use of it as not to disturb the perfect happiness of our nation for no doubt many of our people will be suspicious of thee and for the first time in thousands of years a pseudopsy will lay him down to sleep and in his dreams feel the touch of the dancing spectre of the upper world i promised long thumbs that he should have no reason to be dissatisfied with me and then making an excuse that i was a weary i feasted my eyes for several moments upon the glorious scene spread out before me it was the city of the formifolk in all its splendour a splendour alas unseen by unknown to the very people dwelling in it for to them its silver walls and arches its endless rows of glorious candelabra uplifting their countless clusters of never-dying jets of flame its exquisitely carved and chiselled portals and gateways its graceful chairs and settees and beds and couches and tables and lamps and basins and ewers and thousands of articles of furniture all in purest silver hammered or wrought by the cunning hands of their ancestors while they still were possessed of the power of sight could only be known to these their descendants by the sole sense of feeling from the lofty ceilings of corridors and archways from the jutting ornaments of the house fronts from cornice and coping from the four sides of columns and from the corners of cupolas and minarets here and there and everywhere hung silver lamps of more than oriental beauty of form and finish all with their never-dying tongues of flame sending forth a soft though unsteady light to fall upon sightless eyes but yet these countless flames by the aid of which i was enabled to gaze upon the splendour of this city of silver palaces were life if not light to the pseudopsies for they warmed these vast subterranean depths and filled them with a deliciously soft and strangely balmy air and yet to think that bulger and i were the only two living creatures to be able to look upon this scene of almost celestial beauty and radiance it may be sad and plunged me into such a fit of deep abstraction that it required a second gentle tug of long thumb's hand to bring me to myself 
as we crossed the bridge and entered the city proper i was delighted to note that the streets and open squares were ornamented with hundreds of statues all in solid silver and that they represented specimens of a race of great beauty of person and then it occurred to me how fortunate it was that the pseudopsies could not gaze upon these images of their ancestors and thus become living witnesses of their own woeful falling away from the former physical grace of their race now like human ants that they were the farmer folk began to swarm forth from their dwellings on every side of the city and my keen ear caught the low shuffling sound of their bare feet over the silver streets as they closed in about us their arms flashing in the light and their faces lined with strange emotions as they learned of the arrival among them of two creatures from the upper world they were all clad men and women alike in silk garments of a chestnut brown and i had at once concluded that they drew this material from the same sources as the mikamenkies for dear friends you must not get an idea that the former folk were not well deserving of the name which don fum had bestowed upon them they were genuine human ants and except when sleeping always at work it was true that since their blindness had come upon them they had not been able to add a single column or archway to the silver city but in all the ordinary concerns of life they were quite as industrious as ever chasing carving chiseling planting weaving knitting and doing a thousand and one things that you and i with our two good eyes would find it hard to accomplish i had made known to long thumbs the fact that bulger and i were both very tired and weary from our long tramp and that we craved to have some refreshment set before us and then to be permitted to go to rest at once promising that after we had had several hours good sleep we would take the greatest pleasure in being presented to the worthy inhabitants of the silver city it was astonishing with what rapidity this request of mine spread from man to man long thumbs made it known to two at the same time and these two to four and these four to eight and these eight to sixteen and so on you see it wouldn't take long at that rate to tell a million like magic the former folk disappeared from the streets and in a sort of orderly confusion faded from my sight bulger and i were right glad to be conducted to a silver bedchamber where the travellers every want seemed to be anticipated the only thing that bothered us was we had not been accustomed to keep the light burning upon going to bed and this made us both a little wakeful at first but we were too tired to let it keep us from dropping off after a few moments for the mattress was soft and springy enough to satisfy any one and i am sure that no one could have complained that the house wasn't quiet enough end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of baron trump's marvellous underground journey this is in librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state baron trump's marvellous underground journey by ingersoll lockwood chapter seventeen in which you read dear friends something about a live alarm clock and a pseudopsy bather and rubber our first breakfast in the city of silver a new way to catch fish without hurting their feelings how the streets and houses were numbered and where the signboards were a very original library in which books never get dog-eared how velvet souls enjoyed her favourite poets i am presented to the learned barrel brow who proceeds to give me his views of the upper world they entertained me amazingly and may interest you i can't tell you dear friends exactly how long bulger and i slept but it must have been a good while for when i was awakened i felt thoroughly refreshed i say awakened for i was awakened by a gentle tapping on the back of my hand six taps at first i thought i was dreaming but upon rubbing my eyes i saw standing by the side of my bed one of the pseudopsies who feeling me stir took up his tablet and wrote as follows my name is taphard i am a clock there is a score of us we keep the time for our people by counting the swing of the pendulum in the time-house it swings about as fast as we breathe there are one hundred breaths to a minute and one hundred minutes to an hour our day is divided into six hours work time 
and six hours sleep time it is now the rising hour if thou wilt be pleased to rise one of our people from the health house will rub all the tired out of thy limbs i touched taphard's heart to thank him and made haste to scramble out of bed now for the first time i looked about the silver chamber in which i had slept on silver shelves lay silver combs and silver shears and silver knives on a silver stand stood a silver ewer within a silver basin on silver pegs hung silken towels while spread upon the silver floor lay soft silken rugs and above and around on ceiling and walls the tongues of flame were a thousand times repeated in the panels of burnished silver i had made trial of all sorts of oriental rubber and bath attendants in my day but the silent little pseudopsy who laved and rubbed and tapped and stroked me exceeded them all in dexterity added to which was a new charm for i was not obliged to listen to long and senseless tales of adventure and intrigue but was left quite alone to my own thoughts bulger was also treated to a sponging and a rubbing a luxury which he had not enjoyed since we had left castle trump my toilette was no sooner completed than long thumbs made his appearance to inquire after my health and to superintend the serving of my breakfast which consisted of a piece of most delicate boiled fish flanked with oysters of delicious flavour and trimmed with slices of those monstrous mushrooms which i had eaten among the mikamenkis the whole served in a beautiful silver dish on a silver tray with silver eating utensils remembering the strange way in which the fish were caught and killed in the land of amikamenkis i was curious to know how the pseudopsies managed it for i knew enough of them to know that the sensation of anything struggling for its life in their hands would suffice to throw them into fits of great suffering to fill their gentle hearts with nameless terror at the end of one of the many corridors leading out of our city explained long thumbs there is a rocky chamber which was called by our ancestors Upaslok, or the death hole because any being which breathes its air for a few moments is sure to die so they closed it up for ever leaving only a small pipe projecting through the door but strange to say those who breathe this air suffer no pain whatever but presently drop off into a pleasant dream and unless they be rescued would of course never wake again now as our laws forbid us to cause any pain to the most insignificant creature it occurred to our ancestors that by means of a long pipe they could turn this poisoned air into the river whenever they wanted a supply of fish for food this they did and strange to say the moment the fish felt the gas bubbling into the river they at once swam up to the mouth of the pipe and struggled with each other for a chance to catch the deadly bubbles as they left its mouth so pleasant a sensation do they cause as they gradually plunge the creature breathing them into his last sleep and in this way it is we are able to feed upon the fish in our river without breaking the law of the land i began to understand that i had fallen in with a very original and interesting folk but bulger was not altogether pleased with them for several reasons as i soon observed in the first place he couldn't accustom himself to the cold and glassy look of their eyes and in the next he was a bit jealous of their wonderfully keen scent a sense which with them was so strong that they invariably gave signs of being conscious of bulger's approach even before i could see him and always turned their faces in the direction in which he was coming you will remember dear friends that i mentioned the fact that the formifolk went barefoot and that their feet as well as their hands seemed altogether too large for their bodies and i wish to add that while bulger and i were being led through the long corridors and winding passages on our way into the city of silver the three pseudopsies frequently half halted and seemed to be feeling on the floor for something with the balls of their feet i thought no more about it until bulger and i started out for our first stroll through their wonderful town when to my great delight i made the discovery that the numbers of the houses the names of the occupants the names of the streets as well as all signboards so to speak and all guide-posts were in slightly raised letters on the floors and pavements and then the truth dawned upon me that long thumbs and his companions were simply halting now and then to read the names of the streets with the balls of their feet in order to know if they were taking the right road i more than this dear friends the first time bulger and i passed through one of the open squares of the city of silver 
you may imagine my satisfaction upon the discovery that the silver pavements were literally covered with the writings of the pseudopsy authors in raised characters now in don fum's wonderful book he had in his masterly manner given me the key to the language of the formifolk so that with very slight effort i was able to make the additional discovery that some of the streets were given up to the writers of history and some to story writers while others were filled with the learned works of philosophers and others still contained many thousands of lines from the best poets which the nation had produced and i had very little difficulty in discovering which were the favourite poems of the pseudopsies for as you may readily suppose these were polished like a silver mirror by the shuffling of the many thankful feet over their sweet and soulful lines i noticed that the writings of the philosophers in this as in my own world found few readers for the raised letters were in many cases tarnished and black from lack of souls trampling over them in search of wisdom somewhat later when i had become acquainted with velvet souls the daughter of long thumbs a gracious little being as full of inward light as she was blind to the outer world and she invited me to come for a read i had a hard task of it in persuading her that i could not remove what she called my ridiculous foot-boxes and join her in enjoying some of her favourite poems it was to me a delicious pastime to accompany this happy little maiden when she went for a read to walk beside her and watch the ever varying expression of her beautiful face as the soles of her tiny feet pressed the words of love and hope and joy and her heart expanded and she clasped her hands in attitudes of blissful enjoyment seemingly just as deep and fervent as if the blessed sunlight rested on her brow and her eyes were drinking in the glory of a summer sunset o oh, dwellers in the upper world with the light streaming into the windows of your souls with your ears open to the music of pipe and flute and violin and to the sweeter music of the voice of love how much more have ye than she and yet how rarely are ye as happy how rarely do ye know that sweet contentment which as in this case came from within go to the ant consider her ways and be wise which having no guide overseer or ruler provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest in a short time the former folk seemed to become quite accustomed to having bulger and me among them and they apparently touched hands with me in quite as friendly a fashion as if i had been one of them one day long thumbs conducted me to the house of the most aged and learned of the pseudopsies barrelbrow by name he received me very cordially although i interrupted him at his studies for as i entered his apartment he was in the act of reading four different books at the same time two were lying on the floor and he was perusing the raised characters with the soles of his feet and two others were set up on a frame in front of him and he was deciphering them with the tips of his fingers but when informed who i was he stopped work at once and taking up his tablets asked me a number of questions concerning the upper world of which he had however no very exalted opinion you people said he if i understand correctly the ancient writings of those of our nation who still preserved certain traditions of the upper world are endowed with several senses which are utterly lacking in us i am happy to say for if i understand correctly ye have in the first place a sense which ye call hearing a most troublesome sense for by means of it ye are being constantly disturbed and annoyed by vibrations of the air coming from afar now they can be of no possible good to you ye might as well have a sense that would inform you what was going on in the moon therefore my conclusion is that the sense of hearing only serves to distract and weaken the brain another sense that ye are possessed of continued barrel brow ye call the sense of sight a power even more useless and distracting than hearing for the reason that it enables you to know things which it is utterly fruitless to know such as what your next-door neighbours may be doing how the mountains are acting on the other side of your rivers how your sky as ye call it might feel if you could touch it with your fingers which you can't do however how soon rain will fall which is a useless piece of knowledge if ye have roofs to cover you as i suppose ye have but the most ridiculous use which ye make of this sense of sight is the manufacture of what ye call pictures by means of which ye seem to take 
the greatest pleasure in deceiving this very sense of which ye are so very proud if i understand correctly these pictures if felt of are quite as smooth as that panel there but so cunningly do ye draw the lines and lay in the colours whatever they may be that ye really succeed in deceiving yourselves and stand for hours in front of one of these bits of trickery when ye might if ye choose feast your eyes as ye call it upon the very thing which the trickster has imitated now as life is much shorter in the upper world than in ours it seems very strange to me that ye should wish to waste it in this foolish manner then there is another thing little baron continued the learned barrel brow which i wish to mention it is this the people of the upper world pride themselves very much upon what they term the power of speech which if i understand correctly is a faculty they have of expressing their thoughts to each other by violently expelling the air from their lungs and that this air rushing into the ventilators of the brain which ye call ears produces a sensation of sound as ye term it and in this way one of thy people standing at one end of the town might make his wishes known to another standing at the other end now thou wilt pardon my thinking so little baron but this seems to me to be not a whit above the brute creature which opening its vast jaws thus sets the air in motion in calling its young or breathing defiance at an enemy and if i understand correctly little baron so proud are thy people of this power of speech that they insist upon making use of it at all times and upon all occasions and strange to say these talkers can always find plenty of people to open their ears to these vibrations of the air although the effect is so wearying to the brain that in the end they invariably fall asleep but if i understand correctly the women are even fonder of displaying their skill in thus puffing out the air from their lungs than the men are but that not satisfied with this superior power of puffing out the words they actually have recourse to a potent herb which they steep in boiling water and drink as hot as possible on account of its effect in loosening the tongue and allowing the talker to do more puffing than she could otherwise but all this little baron continued the learned barrel brow might be overlooked and regarded in the light of mere amusement were it not for the fact if i understand correctly that brain ventilators being of different sizes in different persons the consequence is that these puffs of air which ye use to make your thoughts to each other produce different effects upon different persons and the result is that the people of the upper world spend half of their time repeating the puffs which they have already sent out and that even then thou canst rarely find two people who will agree exactly as to the number kind strength and meaning of the puffs blown into each other's brain ventilators and that therefore it has become necessary to provide what ye call judges to settle these disputes which often last for lifetimes the two parties spending their entire fortunes hiring witnesses to come before these judges and imitate the sound which the air made when it was set in motion years ago by the angry puffs of the two parties i sincerely trust little baron wrote the learned barrel brow on his tablet of silver that when thou returnest to thy people thou wilt make known to them what i have written for thee to-day for it is never too late to correct a fault and the longer that fault has lasted the greater the credit for correcting it i promised the learned sodopsy to do as he requested and then we touched each other on the back of the head which is the way they say good-bye in the land of the former folk a touch on the forehead meaning how do you do End of chapter 17chapter eighteen of baron trump's marvellous underground journey this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state baron trump's marvellous underground journey by ingersoll lockwood chapter eighteen early history of the pseudopsies as related by barrel brow how they were driven to take refuge in the underworld and how they came upon the marble highway their discovery of natural gas which yields them light and warmth and of nature's magnificent treasure-house 
how they replaced their tattered garments and began to build the city of silver the strange misfortunes that came upon them and how they rose superior to them terrible as they were and no doubt dear friends you would be glad to hear something about the early history of the pseudopsies who they were where they came from and how they happened to find their way down into the world within a world at least this was the way i felt after i had been presented to the learned barrowbrow and so the next time i called upon him i waited patiently for him to finish reading the four books in front of him and then i said be pleased dear master to tell me something concerning the early history of thy people and to explain to me how they came to make their way down into this underground world ages and ages ago wrote the learned barrel brow my people lived upon the shores of a beautiful land with a vast ocean to the north of it and in those days they had the same senses as the other people of the upper world it was a very fair land indeed so fair that in the words of the ancient chronicles the sun looked in vain for a fairer its rivers were deep and broad its plains were rich and fertile and its mountains stored full of silver and gold and copper and tin and so easily mined were these metals that our people became famous as metal workers so deft in their workmanship that the other nations from far and near came to us for swords and shields and spearheads and suits of armor and table service and armlets and bracelets and above all for lamps most gloriously chased and carved to hang in their palaces and temples and so we were very happy until one terrible day the great round world gave a twist and we were turned away from the sun so that its rays went slantingly over our heads and gave us no warmth oh me i could weep now exclaimed the learned barrel brow after all these centuries when i think of the cruel fate that overtook my people in a few months the whole face of our fair land was covered with ice and snow and our cattle died and many of our people too before they could weave thick cloth to keep their delicate bodies from the pinching cold but this was not all the great blue ocean which had until then dashed its warm waves and white foam up against our shores now breathed its icy breath full upon us driving us into our cellars to escape its fury and in a few brief months to our horror there came drifting down upon us fields and mountains of ice which the tempestuous waters cast up against our shores with deafening crash to remain there meant death swift and terrible so the command was given to abandon homes and firesides and escape to the southward and this most of them did but it so happened that several hundred families belonging to the metal-working guilds who knew the underground passages to the mines as foresters know the trackless wood had taken refuge in the vast underground caverns with all the goods they could carry poor deluded creatures they thought that this sudden coming of the winter blast of the blinding snow and vast floating fields of ice was but a freak of nature and that in a few months the old warmth and the old sunshine would come back again alas months went by and their supply of food was almost exhausted and the entrances to the mines were closed by gigantic blocks of ice cemented into one great mass by the snow which the grey clouds had sifted down upon them there was now no escape that way their only hope was to make their way underground to some portal to the upper world so with lighted torches but with hearts plunged in the darkness of despair they kept on their way when one day or one night they knew not which their leaders suddenly came upon a broad street of marble opened by nature's own hands it was skirted by a softly flowing river that swarmed with fish in scales and shells and skin and here our people halted to eat and drink and rest and while one of their number was striking his flint on one occasion to make a fire to cook a meal to his surprise and delight a tongue of flame darted up from the rocky floor and continued to burn giving light and warmth to them as they had brought their tools their drills and chisels and 
files and gravers and blowpipes with them in their carts and wagons they made haste to fit a pipe to this opening in the rock and set up a cluster of lights with food and water and warmth and light their hearts grew lighter especially as they soon discovered that in many of the vast caverns gigantic mushrooms grew in the wildest profusion the wisest of them continued the learned barrel brow at once made up their minds that there must be reservoirs of this gas farther along on this beautiful marble highway so day by day they pushed farther into this world within a world halting every now and then to set up a lighthouse as they called it after advancing several leagues the exploring party upon lighting a cluster of gas jets were stricken almost speechless with wonder at finding themselves upon the very sill of a tower portal opening into a succession of vast chambers some with flat ceiling some arched some domed upon the floors and walls of which lay and hung inexhaustible quantities of pure silver those magnificent caverns were in reality nature's vast storehouses of the glorious white metal and our people made haste to set up clusters of gas jets here and there so that they might view the wondrous treasure house here they determined to remain for here was food and water and never failing supplies and here they would have light and warmth and here they could forget their miseries by working at their calling using the precious metal with lavish hand to build them living chambers and to fashion the thousand and one things necessary for everyday life so great was their delight as metal workers to come upon this exhaustless supply of pure silver that they could hardly sleep until they had set up clusters of gas jets throughout these vast caverns for no doubt little baron thou hast already guessed that this is the spot i am telling thee of that right here it was where our people halted to build the city of silver but one thought troubled them and that was where to find needful clothing for the old was fast falling into shreds and tatters when to their delight they came upon a bed of mineral wool with this they managed to weave some cloth although it was rather stiff and harsh yet it was better than none while exploring a new cavern one day one of my wise ancestors saw a large night moth alight near him and gently loosening some of its eggs he carried them home more as a curiosity than aught else imagine how rejoiced he was however to see one of the worms which hatched out set to work spinning a cocoon of silk half as big as his fist there was great feasting and merry-making among our people upon hearing of this glad news and it was not very long before many a silver shuttle was rattling in a silver loom and the soft bodies of our people were warmly and comfortably clad now long periods of time went by which cut up into your months would have made many many years our people had everything but sunlight and this of course those who were born in the underworld knew nothing about and therefore did not miss but as was to be expected great changes gradually took place in our people to their inexpressible grief they noticed that as they busied themselves beautifying their new homes by erecting arches and bridges and terraces and lining them with glorious candelabra and statues all in cast and wrought or hammered silver their sight was gradually failing them and that in not a very great length of time they should be totally blind this result little baron continued the learned barrel brow was very natural for the sense of sight was in reality created for sunlight for as thou no doubt knowest all the fish that swim in our rivers have no eyes having no need of them it happened just as they had expected in a few generations more our people discovered that their eyes could no longer see things as thou dost but yet they could feel them if they were not too far away just as i can feel thy presence now and tell where thou sittest and how tall thou art and how broad thou art and whether thou movest right or left forward or backward but i cannot tell exactly how thou art made until i reach out and touch thee then i know all yes far better than thou canst know 
for our sense of feeling is keener than thy so-called sight one of my people can feel a grain or roughness upon a silver mirror which to thy eyes seems smoother than glass well strange to relate and yet not strange our ancestors with the going out of their sense of sight also felt their sense of hearing on the wane our ears as thou callest them having nothing more to listen to for eternal silence as thou knowest reigns in this underworld became as useless to us as the tail of the pollywog would be to the full-grown frog and of course with the loss of our sense of hearing our children were soon unable to learn to talk and in a certain lapse of time we came to merit full well our new name of farmerfolk or ant people for we were now blind and deaf and numb it is long very very long little baron continued the learned sidopsy since all recollection of sunlight of colour of sound died out of our minds to-day my people don't even know the names of these things and thou wouldst have as much chance of success wert thou to attempt to tell them what light or sound is as thou wouldst have it thou shouldst try to explain to a savage that there is nothing under the world to hold it up and yet it doesn't fall but if thou shouldst lay several pieces of metal in a row and ask one of my people to tell thee what they were he would try the weight of each and feel its grain carefully possibly smell them or touch his tongue to them and then he would make answer that this is gold this is silver that is copper that is lead that is tin that is iron but thou wouldst say they are all differently coloured canst not perceive that i know not what thou meanest by colour he would reply but mark me now i hide them all beneath this silken handkerchief and still by touching them with my finger-tips i can tell which metal each one is if thou canst do it then art thou as good a man as i what sayest now little baron asked the learned barrel brow while his face was wreathed in a smile of triumph dost think thou wouldst be as good a man as this pseudopsy nay indeed i do not wise master wrote i upon my silver tablet and i thank thee for all thou hast told me and taught me and i ask leave o barrel brow to come again and converse with thee that thou mayest little baron traced the learned pseudopsy upon his silver tablet and then as i turned to leave his chamber he reached quickly after me and touched me with a bent forefinger which meant return thy pardon little baron he wrote but thou art leaving my study without thy faithful bulger am i not right i was astounded for indeed he was right and though without the sense of sight he had seen more than i with two good eyes wide open there lay bulger fast asleep on a silken covered hassock our silent conversation had so worried him that he had sailed off into the land of nod on the wings of a dream he hung his head and looked very shamefaced when my call aroused him and he discovered that i had actually reached the doorway without his knowing it End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of baron trump's marvellous underground journey this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state baron trump's marvellous underground journey by ingersoll lockwood chapter nineteen begins with something about the little sodopsies but branches off on another subject to wit the silent song of singing fingers the fair maid of the city of silver barrel brow is kind enough to enlighten me on a certain point and he takes occasion to pay bulger a very high compliment which of course he deserved the longer i stayed among the sodopsies the more did i become convinced that they were the happiest the lightest-hearted the most contented human beings that i had met in all my travels if it were possible for the links of a long chain suspended over a chasm to be living thinking beings for a short while it seems to me they would hang together in the most perfect accord for each link would discover that he was no better than his neighbour and that the welfare of all the other links depended upon him and his upon theirs 
so it was with the former folk having no sense of sight they knew no such thing as envy and all hands were alike when reached out for a greeting i was amazed at times to see how they could feel my approach when i would be ten or fifteen feet away from them and i often amused myself by trying to steal by one of them in the street but no it was impossible a hand would invariably be held out for a greeting little by little they got over their distrust of me and made up their minds that i had told them the truth when i said that no dancing spectre was forever following at my heels one of the most interesting sights was to see a group of Sudopsy children at play building houses with silver blocks or playing a game very much like our dominoes i noticed that they kept no tally such wonderful memories had they that it was quite unnecessary at first the children were so frightened upon feeling of me that they fled with terror pictured upon their little faces their parents explained to me that i made very much the same impression upon them as if i should feel of a person whose skin was as rough as a sea urchin's when at last i succeeded in coaxing several of them to my side i was astounded to see one little fellow who had by chance pressed his tiny hand against my watch pocket spring away from me terror-stricken he had felt it tick and didn't stop running until he had reached his mother's side his wonderful tale that the little baron carried some strange animal around his pocket soon caused a crowd to collect about me and it was some time before i could persuade even the parents that the watch was not alive and that it was not the little animal's heart which they felt beating on one occasion when a little sodopsy was sitting on my lap with its tiny arm twined affectionately around my neck i happened to make some remark to bulger when to my amazement the child sprang out of my arms and darted away with a look of terror upon his little face what had i done to him why it seems that by the merest chance his tiny hand had been pressed against my throat and that he had been terrified by feeling the strange vibration caused by my voice immediately the report was spread about that the little baron carried another little baron around in his throat that any one could feel him if i would only consent it took me a long while to convince them that what they felt was not another little baron but merely the vibration caused by my expelling my breath in a way peculiar to the people of the upper world but all the same i was obliged to say many hundreds of useless things to bulger in order to give their little hands a chance to feel something so wonderful from the little i have told you about the names of the former folk dear friends you have no doubt understood that their names took their rise from some physical quality defect or peculiarity besides the names i have already mentioned i remember sharp chin long nose silk ears smooth palms big knuckle nail off hammer fist soft touch hole in cheek or hole in chin dimple crooked hair cowlick and so on and so on but to my amazement one day when asking the name of a young girl whose long and delicate fingers had attracted my attention i was informed that her name was singing fingers or possibly i might translate it music fingers i had noticed that the pseudopsies had some idea of music for the children often amused themselves dancing and while so engaged beat time with their fingertips on each other's cheeks or foreheads but i was completely in the dark as to what they meant by singing fingers or why the young girl should have been so named hence i was greatly pleased to hear the maiden's mother ask me whether i would like to feel one of her daughter's songs as she termed it upon my acquiescing the mother approached me and proceeded to roll up the sleeves of my coat until she had laid my arms bare to the elbow then she took my arms and clasped them across my breast one above the other bulger watched this proceeding with somewhat of displeasure in his eyes he had half an idea that these silent people might play some hurtful trick upon his little master but my smile soon disarmed his suspicion singing fingers now drew near and as her sweet face with its sightless eyes turned full upon me i could hardly keep back the tears and yet why grieve for any one who seemed to be so perfectly happy a smile played around her dainty little mouth disclosing her tiny silvery white teeth like so many real pearls and her bosom rose and fell quickly sending forth a faint breathing sound she looked so like a radiant child of some other world that before i thought i cried out speak oh speak beautiful child in an instant she drew back affrighted 
for the sudden vibration of the air had startled her but i reached out and touched her hand to give her to understand that she need fear nothing and then she drew near to me again suddenly her beautiful hands with their long frail delicate fingers were lifted into the air and she began to sway her body and to wave her hands in gentle and graceful motions as if keeping time with some music gradually she drew nearer to me and ever and anon her silken finger-tips touched my hands or arms as if they were a keyboard and she was about to begin to execute a soft and dainty bit of music i noticed that her fingers had some delightful perfume upon them now fast and faster the gentle taps rain upon me with rhythmic regularity they soothe me they thrill me they reach my heart as if they were the sweet notes of a flute or the soft tones of a singer's voice the maiden is really singing to me it seems to me that i can understand what she is saying or rather thinking as her dainty fingertips fairly fly hither and thither and i can hear her low breathing grow louder and louder suddenly she leaves my hands and arms and i feel her gentle tapping on my cheeks and brow so gently oh so gently and soothingly her fingers touch me that at last they feel like rose leaves dragged across my face the sensation is so delightful so like the soft touch of sleep to weary eyes that i drop off in good earnest and when after a moment or so i opened my eyes there sat the smiling form of folk waiting for me to awake and there stood the radiant visaged singing fingers in front of me childlike waiting to be commended and so you see dear friends that it is not so hard to be happy after all if you only set about it in the right way the former folk seemed to have set about it in the right way judging by results and they are the only things we have to judge by some men will fish all day and not have a bite and some people will try their whole lives to catch happiness and not get any more than a nibble they don't use the right kind of bait let him try a kind act a live one there was something i wanted to ask of the learned barrel-brow so the next call i made on him i put this question to him is it possible learned master that thy people have absolutely no guide no overseer no rulers the great scholar of the former folk ceased reading the four books which lay opened before him one under each hand and one under each foot as i handed him my silver tablet little baron was his reply if there were only a bramble bush big enough for all you people of the upper world to jump into and if you could only get rid of your ears too you would soon be rid of your rulers who oppress you who prey upon you for no one would have any desire to be a ruler if there was no one left to look at him and if he couldn't hear what the flatterer said about him vanity is the soil that rulers spring from as the mushrooms spring from the rich loam of our dark caverns they pretend that it is the exercise of power that they are so fond of believe them not it is the gratification of their vanity and nothing else if it were only in thy power to say to every man who itched to be a ruler well and good brother a ruler thou shalt be but bear in mind weak man that when thou hast donned thy gaudy uniform and mounted thy gaily caparisoned steed when thou ridest at the head of troop and cavalcade with ten thousand armed men following thee on foot as slaves their master and the plaudits of the foolish multitude rend the air no eye shall witness the splendour of thy triumph no ear catch a sound of the deafening cheers take my word for it little baron no one would want to be a ruler any more where there are no rulers little baron continued the learned barrel brow there can be no followers where there are no followers there will be no quarrelling when it becomes necessary in our nation we form the great circle for deliberation each man writes out what he thinks on his tablet then the opinions are read and counted and the majority rules but we form the great circle only in times of urgent need generally speaking the smaller circles answer all the purposes in fact the family circle is in most cases quite sufficient i touched first barrel heart in token of my gratitude for the many things which he had taught me and then the back of his head to bid him good night you may imagine his and my delight dear friends when the wise bulger raised himself on his hind legs and with his right paw also thanked the learned barrel brow 
and then bade him good night by a light tap on the back of his head fortunate the traveller wrote the learned sodopsy attended by so wise and watchful a companion true like a child he goes on all fours but by so doing he brings his heart and his brains on the same level the only way for a man to wear them if he would do his fellow-creatures any good the trouble with thy people in the upper world little baron is that they think too much they clasp minds instead of clasping hands they send messengers with gifts instead of giving themselves they hire people to dance for them to sing for them to be merry for them they will not be satisfied until they have hired people to help them be sorry to whom they may say my friend is dead i loved him weep three whole days for him End chapter nineteen